been nice and patient. Uh, when I was asked to do this talk, I was a little taken aback because I was like, hey, yo, diet. Um, what is there to say? Um, what's wrong with the paleo diet? Everything. It's, uh, what I think of as, uh, MBF, male bovine fertilizer, which is a nice way of saying BS. Uh, it's a bunch of nonsense. It's a bunch of made up garbage. Um, uh, it's a, something that was concocted by a bunch of people who want to sell you books. Um, that's based on a lot of just conjecture and foolishness. And so we're going to examine what these people say and point out as quickly as we can why it's all a bunch of hooey. So I call this raising, as in tearing down, great expectation. What's wrong with the paleo diet hypothesis? And uh, as always, I start all my uh, talks off with a quote from God's Word. It says, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health. This comes from the book of 3 John, verse 2. And if you follow the advice given in Genesis, eat plant-based diet, you will be in good health. If you adopt so-called paleo diet, you won't be. So what is the so-called paleo diet hypothesis? Well, first of all, Paleolithic means old stone age and refers to a period that, depending on which author you read, you can uh, go from anywhere from 10 to 20 to as long ago as 100,000 years uh, of human history. And uh, so the Paleo diet hypothesis is uh, all about what some people allege human ancestors might have been eating during this very broad time period. Why do I say might have been eating? Because none of us were there. People were there. No one really knows. But people have tried to come up with theories to essentially justify what they essentially want to believe that people were eating. And, uh, and so they've come up with these so-called paleo diet hypotheses. And essentially most of these diets advocate a diet that's very heavily based on animal foods. And these diets cannot be justified by what we see when we look at human health and physiology, how our bodies are designed, and what actually happens to us when we eat a diet that's based largely on animal foods. And what's very interesting to me um, is that these theories are based on lots of conjecture, but very little hard science. And in addition, most of the leading proponents of these so-called paleo uh, dietary theories are not medical doctors. Why is that important? Am I just being a physician snob? No. I think it's telling because these dietary regimens, again, advocate a dietary pattern that's very heavily based on animal foods, animal fats, animal protein. And the most current medical research shows that diets that are heavily based on animal fat, animal protein, promote excess levels of chronic disease. And most medical doctors now are encouraging their uh, uh, patients to move away from this kind of diet because we know that if you're sitting at home chowing down on all of this grease and fat and animal protein, you're going to have heart disease, you're going to be at increased risk for cancer, you're going to be at increased risk for uh, constipation, uh, colon cancer, diabetes, and a host of other chronic health problems. And so it is just ridiculous to be encouraging people to go out and eat these kinds of diets when you know it's going to promote excess disease. And so that's why I find that these, these theories just utterly stupid and ridiculous. So what exactly is the paleo diet hypothesis? Well, a typical paleo diet uh, plan recommendation is actually rather oxymoronic in that it would include the following. All the lean meat, fish, and seafood you can eat, but no cereals, 
So that means no, no whole grains, such as, you know, no whole wheat, no uh, uh, corn, no fiber, no uh, rice, no legumes. And so no beans, no peas, no lentils, uh, no dairy. Yay. Uh, <laughs> uh, no processed foods. That's good. Uh, but they also want you to eat, uh, they, all, they want you to eat relatively high amounts of animal protein. That's bad, because if you read the uh, China study from, uh, that was published by Dr. Colin Campbell, you know that when you eat large amounts of animal protein, you're going to be uh, uh, dealing with uh, very high amounts of uh, cancer in, in a very short period of time. Um, they want you to eat fewer carbohydrates. But at the, somehow in... Um, eating fewer carbohydrates and no cereals and no legumes, somehow you're supposed to get a large amount of fiber. Well, where the heck is this fiber going to come from? Because we know that animal foods have no fiber in them. Well, they say from non-starchy fruits and vegetables. Which ones are those exactly? I'd like to know. Um, they want you to eat foods with high potassium and low sodium. Hmm, which ones are those? Because I know that plant foods are loaded with potassium and have very little sodium, whereas animal foods, because they are full of blood, have a lot of sodium and very little potassium. Um, so, again, you know, how exactly are you going to kind of, you know, uh, uh, follow this paleo prescription um, if you're following the advice that they're, that they're recommending? Uh, it, it's just they're asking you to do things that simply um, are not possible. Uh, and they want you to eat a diet with a net alkaline load. Again, that's a plant-based diet, not a diet based on animal foods. And this is the one I really love. They want you to eat, a di eat foods that are rich in phytochemicals. Well, phyto, what does that mean? That, that means plant chemicals, vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants once again, this is a plant-based diet. So somehow, in the midst of eating all that lean meat, fish, and seafood, you're also supposed to get a lot of fiber, a lot of phytochemicals, a lot of vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. This is utterly ridiculous and impossible to do. So, the paleo diet hypothesis is based on several faulty assumptions. Number one is that early humans were primarily hunters. And some people say, okay, well, yeah, clearly early humans were not equipped to hunt because we couldn't run very fast. Obviously, we don't have the physical equipment to hunt. So some people say, well, no, we didn't hunt. What we did was we went around the savannah and we scavenged. You know, we went in behind the lions and the hyenas and we found their leftovers and we would scrape whatever we could off the leftover bones or we would crack open these, you know, diseased rotting carcasses and swill the marrow out of those bones. Yeah? Oh, really? Okay. If you believe that, I got something I want to sell you. And then other, <laughs> other people um, believe that only animal foods could serve as concentrated uh, uh, energy sources. Um, some people have argued that uh, the human GI tract changed over time to um, adapt to less bulky foods, and that necessarily meant that we were moving away from plant foods to animal foods, because, of course, they're, you know, the only... Uh, uh, less bulky foods are animal foods. There are no less bulky plant foods because, you see, the only plant foods that you can eat is hay. You guys understand that, right? There's no such thing as, like, fruit or, or grains or, or beans or tubers or, or roots. You all aware of that, right? Those things don't exist, right? There's no such things as potatoes or peas or beans, right? There's only hay. Y'all know that, right? Are you guys with me? There's only hay. Right? And the only kind of vegetarians and, and herbivores in the world are the ones with four stomachs. Right? Because, well, that's just the way it is. And if you don't understand that, 
you don't understand the paleo diet. <laughs> All right. Another false assumption that the propensity to hunt necessarily leads to a bigger brain and to increased intelligence. Okay, tell that to my dog. She loves to drink out of the toilet. <laughs> um, and they say meat is brain food. Okay, uh, starches will always raise your insulin level. And this is the big one that vegetarians are less healthy than meat eaters. Did y'all know that? Vegetarians are less healthy than meat eaters. Vegetarians are dropping dead all over the world. Vegetarians die sooner. They have more disease. They just walk down the street and just fall out. See, meat eaters have prostate trouble. Vegetarians have prostrate trouble. <laughs> we, just, we just go prostrate. Isn't there an ambulance outside waiting? Wait, just someone? wait. <laughs> so we're going to deal with these faulty assumptions one by one. Uh, yeah, I, by the way, I'm kidding. For those folks of you who are going to watch this online, please know that I'm just joking. All of those things I just mentioned are not true. So let's start with number one. Early humans were primarily hunters. Not true. Now, let's look at why Neanderthals are extinct. The caption on the cartoon reads, and now there go the Wilsons. Seems like everyone's evolving but us. There used to be two separate and distinct species of humans, Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis. Modern humans are Homo sapiens sapiens. Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis, are extinct, and most authorities have concluded that they did not contribute any genetic material to the human gene pools. Now, there's some debate about that, but most people think that they didn't. Neanderthals never numbered more than a, about 10,000 individuals worldwide and are believed to never have developed writing, music, or sophisticated language, cultures, or the technology of Homo sapiens. Well, what's interesting about uh, Neanderthals is that Neanderthals are believed to have eaten a primarily meat-based diet. Isotope studies of their bones suggest that they ate a primarily animal food-based diet. Now, since we know that plant-derived phytochemicals and antioxidants improve and potentiate fertility, a dearth of these nutrients may help explain why Neanderthals were never very numerous. Obviously, their lifestyle did not equate with evolutionary success or species survival. The uh, caption reads, Neanderthals, Neanderthals, can't make fire, can't make a spear, nya, nya, nya. Hunting, furthermore, would have exposed Neanderthals to all of the dangers, vagaries, and vicissitudes of a predatory lifestyle, including an early death. And clearly, these people were rather stupid. As you can see, it says, shh, Zog, here comes one now. Obviously, they weren't very bright. Anatomical deformities found in Neanderthal's bones due to apparent nutritional deficiencies and periods of food scarcity, scarcity excuse me, are common findings in Neanderthal fossils, as is evidence of frequent fractures, infections, and joint disease. Also, because dietary antioxidants and phytochemicals augment and preserve mental functioning, their absence suggests that Neanderthals probably weren't very bright. Uh, the caption reads, I will not act primitive in class. He obviously had to write that several times on the, uh, on the board. Clearly, building one's culture and economy around such a non-sustainable form of food gathering as hunting is a recipe for injury, starvation, and ultimately, extinction. And finally, she says, I see your little petrified skull labeled and resting on a shelf somewhere. Well, let's look at what some other theories are about how humans may have hunted. Now, some authors, other authors have postulated that, well, okay, 
obviously we didn't have the technology to, uh, to uh, you know, they didn't have sophisticated bows and arrows or very effective spears. No, what humans actually pr did was these pre and early humans hunted by running prey to exhaustion. They would just run and run and run and run and run these animals down until they became so exhausted they would just drop dead. Well, these implausible theories are advanced because of, number one, mistaken notions about the importance and necessity of animal foods in the human diet. Running prey to exhaustion is not a practical method of hunting since it requires an enormous expenditure of energy that would likely not be recouped given hunting's inherent inefficiency. First of all, the one thing that you have to remember is that in nature, survival is fundamentally a question of energy in versus energy out. You expend more energy looking for food or trying to get your food than you can obtain from the food that you finally get. You are not going to survive. So the point is that you have got to obtain your food in the most energy efficient manner possible. You cannot afford to go out and expend thousands of calories chasing food all over the savanna that you don't catch. In, uh, in the hopes of, you know, w you know, maybe, you know, one day uh, 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 finally chasing something down to the point that it's going to drop dead. There are no existing carnivores or predators that hunt by trying to run prey to exhaustion because that simply is not an efficient or effective way to hunt. Nothing on earth exists or has ever existed trying that, that has hunted that way. That's a ridiculous theory. Um, animals that, that uh, um, are, are typical prey species are excellent endurance animals. The, um, the animals that, we, that, we, that are typical prey species are the animals that we have uh, traditionally used throughout history as our beasts of burden because they have such good endurance. And these are animals that can typically outrun even the most uh, robust predators. So trying to run these animals to exhaustion would be uh, absolutely futile. But for human beings, it would be even more dangerous. And that is because of the size of our brain. The human brain makes this theory utterly ridiculous. Our brain is only 2 to 3% of our body weight, but uses 20 uh, to 50 per, uh, uh, 20 to 50 percent of our body's oxygen. It uses 25 percent of all the energy that we expend every day. One fourth of the energy you burn every single day is used by only three percent of your body. It uses 40 percent of the glucose your body burns every day. That means that your brain is the most metabolically active tissue in your body and it continually gener generates huge amounts of waste heat that has to be rapidly and efficiently dissipated in order to remain functional. Animals that are designed to run long distances in the heat of the day often have mechanisms for pre-cooling blood before it actually enters the skulls. Humans do not. A skull is like an oven in that it traps heat because heat does not radiate effectively across bone. The only way to get rid of heat uh, in the skull is either by absorbing it, bef uh, by pre-cooling blood before it actually enters the skull, or uh, more uh, effectively, removing it through blood flow out of the skull, it's much like a radiator, uh, the radiators in our car. Because the temperature of blood can only be decreased by a few degrees, pre-cooling blood only works for very small brains. The human brain is so large and so metabolically active and generates so much heat that the only way to keep it cool is to remove the heat it generates uh, from the skull through high volume blood flow and, uh, and then use our naked skin and sweat mechanism to dissipate that heat. Brain tissue is exquisitely sensitive to small elevation in temperature. A rise in our core temperature of only five degrees Fahrenheit uh, and an adult will cause confusion, stupor, and a loss of motor control. This is known as heat stress or heat exhaustion. If our core temperature rises by six degrees, only six degrees, brain death will likely occur. 
without taking special precautions, pre- uh, repeatedly attempting to run prey to exhaustion on the African savanna, which is where humans were thought to have uh, evolved or developed, would not only likely be futile, but would generate so much excess body heat and water loss that it would probably overwhelm our heat regulation mechanisms and be more likely to result in heat stroke and brain injury or brain death rather than a successful hunt. Modern, long-distance, and marathon races are only possible and practical because of regularly spaced watering stations that keep runners hydrated and help them cool down. And even despite these precautions, we still see that heat stroke and heat exhaustion are our major concern and a common occurrence in these races. It goes without saying there are no watering stations in nature, and putative proto-humans were almost certainly not smart enough to come up with the commensurate, sophisticated technology to keep themselves properly hydrated by spacing out uh, uh, watering mechanisms throughout the savannah. Dis- furthermore, distance races are run on paved roads or specially prepared tracks with expensive purpose design running shoes and still runners suffer frequent injuries and joint problems. Repeatedly attempting to run long distances over rocky, uneven ground would lead to serious leg injuries and foot injuries and joint strains and sprains that would leave the runners incapacitated and unable to function, let alone hunt. I mean, we, you, you see what happens to elite runners. To postulate that an entire group of, of humans who were not elite runners would somehow survive by trying to use this as a mechanism for hunting is utterly, utterly, utterly ridiculous. Distance running also exerts severe strains on the human body that can take days to weeks to overcome. The strain goes beyond mere wear and tear on the legs and joints. Research has shown that running a marathon race stresses the body so severely that it temporarily weakens the immune system and predisposes runners to being more susceptible to contracting infections for a week or more after a race. These facts strongly suggest that repeated and constant distance running on rocky, uneven ground without modern safety equipment is not a natural, healthy, or sustainable activity for humans. Thus, theories suggesting humans ran prey to exhaustion as a way of obtaining food are simply not compatible with human anatomy, physiology, nutritional needs, nor our long-term health exigencies. Moreover, because of it, individuals would have to have enough reserve energy to actually kill any prey they were miraculously able to run down and then carry the flesh back to their home base while defending their catch from the other uh, predators on the savanna, um, the likelihood that this was the way pre and early humans obtained food is simply absurd. Walking at moderate speeds is a largely aerobic meaning oxygen-using activity that utilizes slow-twitch muscle fibers and primarily burns fat while sparing glycogen, that is, um, muscle uh, carbohydrate. Thus, anaerobic fast-twitch muscle fibers are effectively held in reserve to provide quick bursts of energy to escape predators and aid in self and or collective defense. By contrast, in addition to generating large amounts of exercise-induced waste products that need time to be metabolized uh, and muscle recovery, distance running depletes liver and intramuscular glycogen stores. This means that at the end of an extended run, runners would have little to no reserve energy available. This energy-depleted condition would be very dangerous because it would mean that these distance runners would be extremely vulnerable on the uh, predator-filled savanna. In other words, they would be exhausted laying out there for any lion or hyena to basically eat for dinner. Furthermore, because of the small size of our stomach and our inability to eat carrion, there is no way we could recover the vast amounts of energy attempting to run prey to exhaustion would require and expend. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in the, uh, the next couple of slides. But what you find that's very interesting about carnivores is that carnivores have gigantic stomachs. A carnivore typically has a stomach that allows it to eat 30% of its body weight at a single meal. That means a 300-pound lion can eat 90 pounds of meat at a single sitting. A um, a 100-pound wolf can eat up to, um, what is it, 30 pounds. 
of, of, of meat at a single sitting. So that means that they can actually eat enough calories at one sitting to not only recover the energy that they expended in the hunt, but they can also eat enough calories at that one sitting to last them four, five, maybe seven or eight days until they're actually able to make another kill. By contrast, our stomachs are so small, we can't even eat enough food at one meal to last us the whole day. Because like other herbivores, we are batch feeders, meaning that we have to eat multiple times over the course of the day to ingest enough calories to uh, give us a full, day, a full day's worth of calories. So that is why hunting is not efficient for us, because we are batch feeders, uh, unlike carnivores. And again, a carnivore can make a kill today, sit on that kill for three or four days and feed from it, over the next few days, and even though it's rotting and putrid and filled with maggots and bacteria and flies and, you know, all sorts of parasites and all kind of crap, they don't get sick because they have an immune system and a stomach that is full of acid that is strong enough to dissolve, you know, uh, uh, pennies and, and, and hooves and horns and antlers so that they can kill any, any kind of pathogen that's in that rotting flesh so they're able to, again, continue to feed from that rotting carcass. So they can continue to recover energy from that decaying flesh. We can't. You know that human beings get sick from poorly cooked turkey. You know, so there's no way that we can eat rotting flesh. So again, we could not recover additional energy from a decaying carcass. And, you know, people say, well, maybe they tried to cook it. Look, if we, can't rec if we can't eat turkey that's been roasted in a climate-controlled oven, do you honestly think trying to cook something over a, a flame on, a, on the African savanna is going to sterilize it? It won't. It absolutely won't. And again, and there's no, I, and I'm just going to kind of skirt this because I'm going to come back to this point. And there's... Uh, there's no nutritional advantage to seeking large amounts of protein. And that's the other major point I want you guys to understand. Because people keep talking about hunting, hunting, hunting. Maybe there would be some point in hunting if there was some great advantage to having huge amounts of protein. If, for instance, having a giant amount of protein somehow made me live 10 years longer or somehow, you know, boosted my immune function or somehow, uh, you know, made me have, you know, bigger babies or, or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, made me survive the winter better than, than people that didn't, then there would be an advantage to, to seeking out these, these large amounts of protein. You, you follow me? Do you realize that every gram of protein that I ingest today that I don't use as protein my body will convert to carbohydrate. Your body does not store protein. So there is absolutely no advantage to you in eating excess protein. So if I eat 10 pounds of protein today, which, by the way, I can't because my body can't ingest that much, it serves no purpose. Because for every gram of protein that I eat that I don't use, it gets converted into carbohydrates and then it stresses the heck out of my kidneys because I have to excrete all that nitrogen uh, in my urine. So there is no nutritional advantage and there's lots of disadvantages in eating excess protein because it dries the daylights out of your body. So again, there is no advantage to seeking out large amounts of protein, particularly animal protein, because it acidifies your body, weakens your bones, and stresses your kidney. By the way, plant protein does not do the same thing because plant protein is alkaline, doesn't weaken your bones, and you can get rid of the excess protein without losing calcium. But that's another le lecture. Well, okay. And I've touched on this a little bit. They said, well, we were scavengers. Yeah, right. You know what? I have put this uh, statement out, and, I'm, and, I, and since this is going online, I'm going to put it out again. 
I will pay $10,000 to anybody who can go out on the African savannah and survive for two weeks scavenging. Now, this is the caveat. You get no antibiotics, you get no IV fluid, and the minute you call a doctor, the bed is off. <laughs> okay? <laughs> because you can't do it. You'll get sick as a dog. Human beings do not have the physiology to scavenge. Our stomach acid, um, uh, the pH of a carnivore's stomach is less than one. That is uh, um, stronger than the acid in a car battery. It will dissolve metal, it'll dissolve bones, it'll dissolve hooves, hides, horns, antlers, you name it. And it'll kill all of the bacteria and pathogen that you will find in rotting carcasses. And that's why these animals can eat stuff that's putrid and foul and rotting and not get ill. Furthermore, they have a very robust immune system in their GI tract that will allow them to eat all these pathogens and not become sick because that's what they're designed to do. Again, we aren't. And that's why if you leave a piece of meat out on the counter too long and you go back and you eat it, you will become violently ill because your body is not designed to eat that crap. We are not scavengers. We cannot scavenge. We will become deathly ill from trying to do so. So to postulate that somehow humans were swilling the marrow from rotting bones on the savannah is just stupid. And any researcher on UC Berkeley, Catherine Milton, and all the rest of them who talk this crap, I dare you to do it. I absolutely, I'm putting it, I'm throwing down the gauntlet. I dare you to do it. And if you do it and you don't get sick, I will pay you 10 grand out of my pocket. All right, because of the small capacity of the human stomach and our inability to eat carrion, humans cannot recover the large amounts of energy from a single carcass the way carnivores can. This is why hunting is much less beneficial for us. Thus, in the absence of reliable, large-scale preservation methods, hunting is not an efficient way of obtaining energy for Stone Age humans. This is why throughout history, crop failures have, been, have resulted in famine, starvation, and death for human populations, and why plant-eating um, uh, locusts have been considered a plague and not a food bonanza. Which you would think they should be, right? Well, then there's the theory that, well, only animal foods are high, energy, high in energy. Oh, really? Well, it turns out that the energy content of wild plant foods are essentially equal. A study by Dr. Boyd Eaton in an article called Paleolithic Nutrition that was published in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine back in 1985 showed that when he looked at the typical foods eaten by Stone Age societies, modern Stone Age societies, the wild game that uh, he studied had an energy content of 1.41 calories per gram, while the wild plant foods had an energy content of 1.29 calories per gram. Who remembers how to round up and round down? That's 1.4 versus 1.3 calories per gram. That's no statistical difference. That means that energetically, these foods are equivalent. But nutritionally, they're very different. Why is that? Because the plant foods are much more nutritionally dense. They have more fiber, more vitamins, more antioxidants, more phytochemicals that promote health, disease, and help increase longevity. So in this setting, no truly intelligent creature would waste their time or risk energy chasing around animals they're not likely to catch when they've got perfectly good, equally ener uh, energy uh, ef uh, uh, um, uh, uh, efficient plant foods, but much more nutritionally beneficial plant foods available. You, you, you feel me? All right. And while hunting may employ a limited use of cooperation and coordinated activity, human plant gathering actually entails a much more sophisticated use of these and other skills, such as harvesting, caching activities, etc. 
Humans became specialists at gathering, that is, searching for a special and specific high-energy, nutrient-dense plant foods like seeds, grains, legumes, roots, tubers, nuts, in addition to leafy plants and fruits. And this is what drove the development of human intelligence. And this is what allowed our digestive tract to shrink down from that digestive tract de designed for those more bulky plant foods to these more uh, uh, easily stored and, high and, and energy dense but less bulky plant foods. So this is why we have a smaller GI tract, because we learn to utilize higher energy plant foods. Well, what about the assertion that hunting leads to big brains? Well, let's take a look at this Jurassic calendar. Well, every day is the same thing. It says kill something and eat it. You kill something and you eat it. So the theory is that cooperative hunting and meat eating spurred the development of human intelligence. Oh, really? Well, my counter argument is this. There are many species of predator. None are exceptionally bright. The caption reads, I lift, you grab. Was that concept just a little too complex, Carl? If meat-eating leads to big brains and intelligence, then why can't my neighbor's cat send me an email, and why is the dog still drinking from the toilet? By the way, when you guys sit down for your snacks, remember the dog so he isn't forced to improvise. The other problem that I have with uh, this hunting mythology is that it's essentially sexist. Women are reduced to cheerleaders while men do all the work, you know, because we're out there bringing home the bison and the women are down there cheering for us, right? It necessarily postulates that women are wholly dependent on men to procure a diet that they need to live and raise children. Well, that is not a dynamic you see anywhere in nature. In every species of every animal all over this planet, the female of every species is able to procure the diet she needs to both uh, uh, take a pregnancy to completion and also to raise her children. There is absolutely no species on earth where the female is dependent on the male to provide her the food she needs to uh, um, uh, uh, take a pregnancy to completion and to raise her children. And so it's utterly ridiculous for uh, human males to come up with this crap that women need men in order to survive. I mean, they might want us, but they don't need us. If hunting, and furthermore, if hunting is responsible for human intelligence, then why is it that women are as least as intelligent as men with similar sized brains? Some would argue that they're more intelligent than we are. And ultimately, the dynamic is unidimensional. You chase something and you kill it. We're getting our butts kicked. Starvation, injury, and foodborne disease all lead to early death and depletion of the family. And as I stated before, this is probably why Neanderthals no longer exist. In any event, it doesn't take a lot of brain power to chase something and kill it. So this is my hypothesis. Hunting is actually a plot devised by women. Because you see, hunting is very time consuming and inefficient. In Stone Age societies, more than 80% of the calories consumed are actually provided by the gathering efforts of women. So could it be that hunting was in fact invented by women to give men something to do and keep them, out, keep them out of trouble. Think about it. Men sent off to hunt, hang out with other guys, and spend all day chasing things that they never or rarely catch. They come home too tired to get into mischief and so hungry, they cling to their mates and appreciate the foods that their uh, spouses pr provide. Right? And this is very well illustrated by my very next slide. She says, it could be worse. He could be out chasing you know what. <laughs> so looking at the role that plant foods actually played 
in our history and in the development of our intelligence, I would argue that they played a much more important role than animal foods. This is from a book by Michael Pollan um, called The Botany of Desire. He says, people who were drawn to flowers and who further could distinguish among them and then remember where in the landscape they'd seen them would be much more successful foragers than people who were blind to their significance. This next quote is from a book by Steven Pinker, who is a uh, psychologist at Harvard. And this is from his book, And How the Mind Works. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> he says, natural selection was bound to favor those among our ancestors who noticed flowers and had a gift for botanizing, for recognizing plants, classifying them, and then remembering where they grow. In time, the moment of recognition, much like the quickening, would become pleasurable, and the signifying thing, a thing of beauty. And as you all know, flowers are a precursor to what? Fruit. And fruit is what? Food. So what we find is that once you recognize that relationship, the relationship between flowers and fruit, that then begins to spur a whole uh, new development in terms of spurring the development of human intelligence because once this dynamic is understood, even though the flowers themselves may not be eaten, they still acquire value for what they represent. So flowers come to be seen as symbols and eventually to be used as a kind of language. Understanding the concept and use of symbols would have been an important and early step in the development of humankind spoken and then written languages. Learning to associate the flower symbol with its eventual derivative object, the fruit, may have spurred the formation and use of words, symbols, to represent objects in the environment. The use of symbols, of sounds and symbols to represent objects is, by definition, the use of language. The impetus for the development of language would have been the desire and necessity for being able to communicate to others the location and timing of specific fruiting plants. While language would be very useful for and facilitate foraging for plant foods, it would be less useful and even counterproductive when hunting because of the need for stealth, which is probably why most even cooperative uh, car uh, carnivores have never developed language. Then you have the ability, ability to extrapolate and discover relationships. In other words, if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So if one flower leads to one kind of fruit, you see another flower and you say, hey, that's probably going to lead to another kind of food. So flexibility in this application, in the application of this principle to novel situations and new foods. Understanding the relationship between the flower and its fruit and then between the seed and its plant is a prerequisite for developing agriculture. Then you use that forethought to plan, recognizing and understanding temporal relationships, which allows you to develop organization, memory, and social cooperation. You, you share information by use of language. Then you develop in caching behaviors uh, for saving and storing these live tissue foods. Then you invent counting a methodology to keep an inventory of these stored foods, and then you invent agriculture and the art of crop cultivation. And ultimately, DNA is the quintessential information molecule. This comes from the inf uh, book called The Information by James Gleek. When seen in this light, flowers can be understood to simply be nature's engine for the transmission of the genetic information necessary for making new plants. Thus, rather than hunter-gatherers, humans were essentially always information gatherers, and flowers may well be humans kind, humankind's original information technology. This is what made us so successful as a species and so adaptable, that we could efficiently gather the information necessary for survival and then effectively translate, encode, and transmit this information to successive generations through our use of language and our created cultures. The genius of the human species has been our ability to understand and decipher, either consciously or unconsciously, the information contained in and or communicated by natural phenomena, and then utilize that information for our own purposes and survival. Flowers and plants helped us do that.
Well, I just want to touch on this issue of is meat brain food? What is the best brain nutrition? Humans are slow growing and therefore do not need large amounts of concentrated protein. Protein is most useful for rapid body building, not brain building. Humans are not baby birds. Baby birds have to hatch, fledge, and fly away within three months, which is why they need a lot of protein. Turns out that the brain is made up of highly specialized fatty acids and phospholipids that don't have to be taken in in a preformed format uh, from the diet because our bodies have enzymes that efficiently manufacture them. The largest brains on this planet are made by another herbivore, and that is the elephant. And, and the elephants are also very slow growing. You don't have to take in huge amounts, huge amounts of proteins to grow big brains. That's just a very stupid premise. Are all starches bad? Of course not. That brings up the concept of good carbs versus bad carbs, which is like Dr. Jekyll versus Mr. Hyde. You remember Dr. Jekyll was the good doctor who would go out and treat people and take care of them, but for some reason he drank this horrible potion that turned him into this evil guy, Dr. Hyde. Well, likewise, the good carbs are the ones that God made and the bad carbs are the ones that we make. Uh, good carbs are the ones that are unprocessed and that have fiber in them, whereas the bad carbs are uh, because fiber slows down the absorption of the sugars in the starch, keeps our blood sugar levels from spiking. Carbohydrate and starch that has had its fiber removed is considered processed and therefore is unprotected. Those are the bad carbs. Unprotected starch and carbohydrate can be broken down and absorbed so quickly that it's uh, roughly equivalent to eating pure sugar, and these are said to have a high glycemic index. And as you can see from this graph, um, high glycemic index food like white bread that has no starch causes your blood sugar levels to spike, whereas uh, something like beans, which are uh, loaded with fiber, has a very low glycemic index. So starch in and of itself, does, if it has fiber in it, does not cause your blood sugar level to spike. So starch that is protected with fiber is good and, does not, and will keep your blood sugar level in a very uh, narrow range and does not cause your insulin level to spike. All right. Well, listen, it's kind of late, y'all. Um, so, uh, huh? So I just, I'm, I'm going to, I only have a couple slides left. Um, and I'm, I'm willing to end this here and let you guys go. Go. Um, do you guys want me to finish or to just go ahead and stop right now? Huh? Huh? Okay. So, in short, the, the slides that I had remaining basically just show graphically that vegetarians are healthier um, to put, uh, uh, to basically point out that that aspect of the uh, paleo diet argument is not true. And to just, let me just end with my little epilogue statement. All right. In closing, let me say we have abdicated responsibility for the, our health and that of our children by allowing profit-driven marketing campaigns to dictate how we eat and feed our families. We gorge ourselves on unhealthy food and stuff our children full of misnamed Happy Meals until they come to resemble pint-sized Michelin men and then throw our hands up in despair when they and we develop asthma, obesity, diabetes, depression, and other chronic ailments. The chronic diseases that afflict us did not fall from the sky at the behest of some malevolent god. They are the consequences of our own actions. As such, it is within our power to change our behavior and improve our health. We were all born without preferences. The unhealthy things we eat, we learned to like. We can learn to like healthy foods instead. We can change for the better. We must learn to reject the idea that those things that are pleasurable in life are necessarily those that are destructive to ourselves and or the planet. We must do this not only for our own benefit, but also for the health and well-being of our children 
and for the benefit of the planet and its other inhabitants as well. Thank you. And then what if? All right, well, you guys have been really patient. It's been a long day. Thank you very much.